to uh, present present you our first keynote speaker, Timothy Oaks. Um, Timothy is a professor of geography at the University of Calder, uh, Colorado Boulder and has worked for decades on the social and cultural transformation in contemporary China. Uh, he has, for example, explored uh, China's ethnic tourism, tourism and ur urban planning, as well as the development of, of leisure and consumption zones in China's cities. And uh, his current uh, uh, research examines uh, the technopolitical effects of infrastructural urbanism in China's new area, <laughs> urban zones. Um, and currently, Tim is also leading a, a project called um, China Made Asian Infrastructures and the China Model of Development, uh, which is an international research collective that uh, interesting, interestingly explores both the, the domestic and international dimension of, of China's infrastructure development. And it has importantly contributed in broadening and, and also, I, I guess, shifting uh, the academic focus from, from, from just the geopolitics and geoeconomics um, to the more kind of finer grained analysis of the infrastructures uh, themselves and, 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 and the, the more on the ground uh, social and political uh, dimensions of, of their construction. And, and it, um, uh, I guess that not that many of us here are China, <laughs> China scholars, uh, or in, in, in an, but, but I think that many of us have encountered Chinese infrastructure projects in our field sites in, in different parts of the world and have also tried to make sense of them. And I think Tim, Tim's work uh, not only helps us in understanding how China has become the world's paradigmatic infrastructure state, um, but, but might also help us in, in making connections between the China's um, domestic and, and overseas um, infrastructure projects. But I think uh, Tim's keynote today is, is, is more focused on, 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 on urban infrastructures in, in, in China, and, um, and the title of, of his presentation is is a cities out of reach infrastructures of post-urbanism in China. And, and we are just so happy that you accepted our, our invitation and that you were also able to come here in person. So we appreciate it very much. And now the floor and Zoom is, is yours. And let's hope I'll find here. Great. Thank you so much for the, uh, that warm introduction. And thank you so much for the music. Um, I would, I would be happy just, just having that for the rest of the day. Um, but as you said, we'll go back to the more conventional format. So I'm happy to fill that role. Um, I'm actually really honored and to be here. I was really honored to, to be asked to come um, in part because uh, I'm such a fan of Nikhil's work and uh, Tanya's work. And it's just such a privilege to be uh, included uh, with them on this, uh, on this stage. Um, and thanks to the society for, for the invitation. Um, so, yeah, um, just a, you know, this is my um, last time I was um, in Finland, and this is just just for a little bit of fun. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the last time I was here. Um, <laughs> so I just thought I would share that. Um, a uh, few years back uh, for some skiing. And so I was really, the other thing that I was so um, happy about was being invited to come in the winter um, and, and hope to get a little skiing in while I'm here uh, as well, if the, if the weather um, cooperates. Uh, but uh, let's go back to the, the, the talk. Um, and uh, let's see, I'll start with, with, with this. Um, my, and just a little bit of a word about the title um, of, of my talk. It's, uh, it's inspired by this, this book by Gokta Gunnell and her exploration of technological indeterminacy uh, in the building of the utopian eco-city project of Mazdar in Abu Dhabi. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, in her account of Mazdar's technical systems that were never completed and would never work as designed or intended, uh, Gunnell finds a city just out of reach. But crucially, she argues that in, the, in their indeterminate state of partial completion, these technological systems come to be endowed with lustrous potential. 
In this way, the clear failure of the technical adjustments aimed at a more sustainable climate friendly future is tran transformed into an irresistible promise. Referring to Mazdar's personal rabbit trans rapid transit or PRT system, Gunnell argues that rather than being viewed as a failure, the unfinished PRT offered a permanent gesture toward a technically adjusted future. The PRT's success, in other words, was found in its ever receding potentiality. Half finished infrastructure thus gives rise to multiple, at times contradictory versions of a speculative future. Gunnell writes that, quote, it was not its functionality as infrastructure that made the PRT system visible, but the multiple imaginaries of the future its half finished and half functional state made possible. So the half finished city, and in this rendering, obviously uh, not half finished, but um, the vision uh, uh, of what it might potentially look like, the half finished city that I'm, that I'm interested in is like Mazdar, an eco city endowed with lustrous potential. Guian is a state level new area in southwest China's Guizhou province. Uh, it was designated by the State Council in 2014 as China's eighth uh, national new area uh, development project. And uh, in this map, it's number eight there. Um, Guian is meant to be uh, a demonstration space for eco urbanism as well as serving as a new center for China's big data computing industry and an innovation hub for artificial intelligence and virtual reality software development. It is also charged with showing how big data can solve chronic rural poverty. The new area covers a vast 1800 square, square kilometer stretch of land between the provincial capital and the second largest city in the province, an area slightly larger than the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone. Guian occupies some of the richest and most productive farmland um, in Guizhou, which is a province where chronic uh, chronically low agricultural productivity has historically been the norm. Um, in a place where opportunities for wealth have always been associated with leaving the villages and fields, Guayan's promise of economic development uh, begins with the simple fact that the most, that most of the vis this vast region will be converted to non-agricultural uses. Uh, it also means that Guayan will become a new kind of space, uh, one in which new infrastructure is not only the means for development, but, but, but development's objective as well. Yet this objective means that the promised city to come remains seemingly always half finished. While Gunnell is interested in technological indeterminacy, uh, I'm interested in extending her idea to thinking about a kind of infrastructural urbanism in which the city is just out of reach by design. Because it's not a city that's being built at all, at least not in the conventional sense of a densely settled agglomeration of people and intensive economic activity. Rather, Guayan is an infrastructure space designed for circulation and flow and mobility. If the city to come is imagined as a kind of utopian self-contained and distinct space of cityness that you see, for example, uh, in this rendering. Um, Guayan is actually in its construction as an infrastructure space becoming something uh, quite different. I'm not sure what to call it. I've settled on infrastructure space and I'll talk about what that term means to me in a little bit. Um, but interestingly, this, this space also has echoes of the blended spaces of urbanization that have held sway throughout much of Southeast and East Asia. Um, which are neither rural nor urban, neither countryside nor city. Terry McGee called the Indonesian version of this a desicota. Um, and while I'm not suggesting necessarily that Guayan is simply a desicota with Chinese characteristics, I do think that there are important cultural and social genealogies to this infrastructure space that are important to explore, but which uh, we'll have to set aside for now and I won't have time to go into today. But um, uh, if you're interested, I, I'm giving a talk in a couple of weeks about that particular issue, um, and we'll would be happy to share information about that if, uh, if people are interested. Um, instead, let's, uh, let's take a drive around the half-finished city, um, since that, that's what you do in an infrastructure space. You circulate instead of settle. So um, let's do that. Uh, the promise of Guayana is a shiny new city of, pos of, of, uh, of prosperity 
uh, with green and intelligent technology was palpable during my visits for research during uh, in 2018 and 2019. On one of these visits, I was with my friend, uh, I'll call him Li Jie, driving around on the freshly built grid of super wide and empty boulevards that had been laid down upon uh, the core area of the, of the new, uh, the core part of the new area. We pulled over to inspect um, a newly built yet already dilapidated collection of roadside buildings. What is this place, I asked, squinting through the car windshield. Just some shopping street, he said. Hard to tell, it's never been open. Two rows of buildings recently constructed in a vaguely traditional style yet already falling into disrepair guarded a brick paved pedestrian street. Shops stood empty behind dusty and sometimes broken glass, weeds pushed up between the bricks, piles of rubble were scattered about, the place was deserted. Another ghost mall, Lee snorted. They pop up practically overnight and die just as quickly. He guided his sedan back onto the highway and the abandoned mall disappeared behind us. We drove on along boulevards 10 lanes wide, completely empty of cars. Their straight flatness and decadent width seducing us with the promise of the sprawling metropolis to come. Both the power and the emptiness of that promise are materialized by the many ghost ventures like the decaying mall we had just visited. Many of these buildings had become dilapidated even before the grid of roads had been completed. Their abandonment was all the more striking when viewed from the meticulously landscaped roads themselves. Unlike the fallow farm fields and failed entrepreneurial ventures beyond the guardrails, the roads were lovingly cared for. Their verges kept in a permanent state of floral splendor. Clearly what mattered in Guayan was the roads. The infrastructural skeleton of the fleshy urban body that had been promised. Uh, in one collection of published essays about the culture and history of the new area, a fanciful map um, had been drawn, um, imagining the place as nothing more than a tangled knot of roads. Ram Kulas once observed that in China, new highways were not built in response to an existing need, rather they were aspirational and predictive, meant to trigger what he called future urban situations. The promise suggested by the verdant road is also, however, an invitation to be enrolled in the space of the state. As Penny Harvey has famously argued, roads are central to the state's enactment of territorial integrity, and roads are how the state is imagined by its citizens. This explains perhaps the meticulous maintenance of the road Lee and I drove on. Every day, a small army of well-paid villagers in matching bright orange vests and straw straw cone hats would be out gardening the road, trimming shrubs, planting new flowers, pulling weeds, removing trash. Their labor sharpened the division between the road as a state space and the fields and villages through and over which it passed as the leftover spaces of another era, abandoned and waiting demolition. So, you know, Guizhou is a uh, mountainous plateau region infamous for its historical in impenetrability. Um, lifelines to promises of wealth, if not escape, roads have always been heroic here. Um, an oft repeated quote comes from the Ming Dynasty traveler, uh, the famous Xu Xiaoke, who wrote in consternation shortly after entering Guizhou early in the 17th century, there are so many mountains here. If you want to build a road, the first thing you see in front of you is another mountain. For centuries, Guizhou's few roads were slow, Windering and wind, winding and ponderous affairs. Um, and this fact makes today's expressways and straight wide boulevards all the more monumental. Their magnificent bridges and tunnels render Guizhou's formidable terrain as little more than scenery. This is also part of the road's territorializing effect as a kind of state space. In the power of the grid um, lies precisely um, its contempt for the landscape upon which it has been laid a contempt expressed by its straightness, flatness, and the sheer waste of space in its 10 lane width. Okay, so eventually Lydia and I found ourselves strolling around a former rice paddy. It had been turned into a collection of miniature world monuments, all built from plastic strips meant to look like dried rice husks. There was a Roman Colosseum, a Sydney Opera House, the Pyramids of Giza. 
They were charming in their way, but already falling apart, a monument of uncertain direction as villagers worked out just what to do with the fields that they no longer farm. One villager told me, that little theme park, it will be gone next year. Hannah Appel has, argue, has remarked that infrastructure is futurity and deferral all at the same time. Regularly unfinished and often faulty, new infrastructure is haunted by abandonment, she tells us. The scrappy grassroots theme park is a monument uh, to the worldly aspirations that the grid has kindled, but also to the ways that the world remains just out of reach. After our drive, I reflected on the Ghost Mall, the Plastic Rice Husk theme park, and the other whimsical ventures we visited, a village uh, which included a village that had turned itself uh, into a virtual reality theme uh, playground, um, and also a boarded up Swiss town uh, that nevertheless attracted curious onlookers that nearby, uh, so, so many onlookers that nearby villagers had created a makeshift roadside food truck hotspot. Um, but, you know, overall, the landscape seemed permanently incomplete, um, permanently uh, suspended between a rural past and a promised urban future. And perhaps this sense came from the fact that the infrastructure and not the city was the state's goal. Create a grid, see what happens. This was not so much a city to come as it was a fragmented landscape of perpetual promise, a city just always, uh, always just out of reach. Perhaps the city was not coming at all. Uh, it seemed that whatever was coming was already here and it didn't look anything like a city. Here's what I think. Uh, Guayang is not a space where the countryside is transitioning into a city, but something else altogether. And here I draw a, a little bit of inspiration from Henri Lefebvre who once suggested that we consider the city to be merely one particular spatial outcome of urbanization. He meant that urbanization might be understood as a, an historical process of, of changing social relations that under certain historical conditions resulted in the dense agglomerations of people and built environments that we have come to think of as cities. But as those historical conditions change, a different spatial outcome might result. China seems to be offering us those changing historical conditions. Urbanization and cities then are two separate things. One is a social process, while the other is the physical manifestation of that process. Lefebvre challenged us to think beyond a conventional city-centered understanding of urbanization. And China's infrastructure-driven infrastructure -driven processes of urbanization seem to be doing the same. So having brought Lefebvre into the conversation, let me then just uh, in a more abstract or broader sense, to try to lay out um, elements of a, of a kind of a technical political argument that I'm trying to uh, build about infrastructure and urbanization in China. Uh, having had our, a brief little tour of this, of this area. Um, over the past few years, I've been working on a project uh, that seeks to develop a technopolitical lens to understanding urban development in China. This came out of my interest in engaging the China studies field with some of the broader turns going on in the social sciences, and here has Mir's overview at the beginning that's uh, you know an outlined some of those uh, ideas with the, the material turn, the infrastructure turn, um, and it was curious to me uh, that there was so little discussion going on about infrastructure in the world's paradigmatic infrastructure state. Of course, infrastructure was certainly a topic of conversation, especially once the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, got underway and we started to see references to a China model of development that was driven by investments in mega project infrastructures, particularly the hard infrastructures of connectivity, logistics hubs, and energy development. But there was little discussion of these infrastructures themselves. For human geographers, I suppose, infrastructures were assumed to be uninteresting, merely technical instruments are, are outcomes of policy. Um, and the infrastructure turn was all about disrupting these assumptions by considering a more socio-technical perspective that approached infrastructures as precarious and unpredictable assemblages of human and non-human materials. Infrastructures themselves have an interesting ontological doubleness. As Brian Larkin famously pointed out, they are both material things, railroad tracks, pipelines, asphalt expressways, broadband cables, and relations between those things and between these things and humans. So uh, because infrastructures operate as systems, they are inherently relational. 
this fact uh, means that one can treat infrastructures as objects of analysis, but one can also approach infrastructure as an analytical tool uh, by which one can draw connections between, for example, state processes, policies, engineers, planning documents, concrete materials, automobiles, and their drivers, bridges, and even rainfall, just to name a few. The term infrastructure space was proposed by architectural theorist Keller Easterling in her 2014 book, Extra Statecraft, to identify spaces such as special economic zones, um, export processing zones, logistics hubs, um, where governance is driven by the logic of infrastructure provision. Easterling's approach suggested a reconception of what she called the zone format as a space defined less by the formal state administrative systems by which such spaces were designated and more by the infrastructural assemblages that collected there. Easterling was particularly interested in how infrastructure space has come to define a new urban format. Infrastructural configurations, she argued, have designated, uh, sorry, has displaced formal planning and design to become the basis for, quote, the urban structure itself, the very parameters of global urbanism, unquote. And while much of Easterling's concept overlooks the central role of state planning and territorial administration in China's uh, um, examples, infrastructure space nevertheless offers an intriguing perspective from which to consider the changing nature of urbanization in China where rural and urban have become increasingly blurred and where everyday life is increasingly shaped and lived through so many infrastructural grids. Uh, I suggest that um, viewing China's new urban developments like Guayan as infrastructure spaces moves us beyond the urge to understand them as cities to come. An infrastructural approach reveals how urbanization in China has in practice shifted from a city-centered growth model to a sprawling landscape of grids sprouting up on the edges of and in between established urban centers. At the same time though, this approach puts into sharp relief um, the way new urban developments like Guayan tantalize us with the promise of the ideal city, the city of the future, the city of infinite potential. Um, so uh, this promise of the city to come continues to shape urban development in significant if contradictory ways. So I suppose in part what I'm trying to work out is, a, is an idea of, of an infrastructure space which is built to facilitate mobility and, and, and flow and circulation. And part of the uh, ability or part of the power of that infrastructure space is maintained by, um, I guess I could, would call it an ideological promise of, uh, of a city that will eventually emerge there. Um, but, but will always remain just, just out of reach. Um, so with this observation, I depart somewhat from Asha Min and Nigel Thrift's approach, which they talk up, in which they discuss in their book, Seen Like a City, where they focus on infrastructures uh, in order to emphasize all the overlapping and uncoordinated systems that make up what they call the cityness of cities. Um, and I'm trying to do something I think quite different from that project. Instead, I'm, I'm thinking about infrastructure space as an alternative um, to what we might otherwise think of as the urban or the city. Um, and so, you know, what I'm working toward is the idea uh, that an infrastructure analytic sheds light on the ways uh, national new areas in China can be understood as particular events in an unfolding regime of circulation that has come to dominate urban forms worldwide. But new infrastructures of connectivity, especially expressways, high-speed rail, and so on, are bringing about a proliferation of urban fragments in these spaces. Um, opportunities for wealth are shaped less by proximity to the center than by access to and mobility through the network. One's chances for upward mobility are now measured by one's ability to attach to the grid of connectivity. And this way of understanding uh, these new areas echoes a broader global trend in which logistic cities have become an increasingly dominant model for urban planning, whereby urban areas are increasingly designated, or sorry, designed to maximize the uninterrupted flow of goods, services, and labor. Urban landscapes come to be defined more by network connectivity than by the gravity of a dominant center. Uh, and this is noted by Marcus Hess in his 2008 book, uh, The City as Terminal, uh, where he says, quote, the spatial fixed point of the organization of everyday life is no longer the city center. But, the, but are the individually shaped networks of activities which may stretch over the entire urban region and beyond. 
So focus on this extended network of activities that increasingly defines the experience of urbanization in China suggests that we consider urban scales in China in ways that move beyond the kind of given state administrative levels that uh, conventionally define those uh, urban spaces. Um, it also suggests that we pay particular attention to the uneven constitution of the scales of human circulation within the urban network. Uh, this is because a great deal of land in these spaces is actually barely touched by this grid of connectivity. The actual unevenness um, of what is purported to be a uniform matrix renders these spaces sites of technopolitical contestation. Um, so while infrastructures introduce an ontology of connectivity and movement stretching into the hinterlands of urban agglomerations, they also become critical to what Martin Coward has called a new ontopolitical imagination, one in which life is defined by connectivity. Coward writes, the loss of connectivity or the threat of such a life uh, of loss, or we might add the inability to connect at all, is thus seen as a threat to life itself. This ontopolitics is thus constitutive of a political dynamic of inclusion and exclusion, connection and disconnection. Politics in such a situation, quote, is less a question of who counts than a question of who connects. All right. So having laid that out a bit um, in terms of some of the kind of broad points of general argument that I'm trying to kind of develop in various ways, um, let's go back to Guayan and um, first uh, offer you a few quotes from uh, discussions that I had with, with planners and, and officials in this area back in um, 2018 and 2019. Um, the, the planners and officials I interviewed insisted cons consistently that Guayan would not be a city, uh, but something else um, when it was complete. As one, uh, at least one planner used the term post-urban um, to describe what was coming um, and also used the term uh, uh, city 2.0 or, or urban 2.0. Um, and this vision was anchored um, as we might expect by state-of-the-art infrastructures of connectivity, environmental management and security and surveillance. Um, Guayan, in other words, would be a space that finally got the infrastructure right. Um, and so there was a lot of um, uh, discussion, and, and, and I heard this again and again in, in a lot of the interviews that I did, of uh, what, what, what made it a special place was uh, the ability, that the, the, the fact that they were starting tabula rasa um, in some ways, laying all the right infrastructure um, first, uh, and then the, the city would kind of naturally follow, but there really wasn't that much concern about what the eventual city would be. The focus really was on, 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 all, the, uh, on all the infrastructure um, and that this could be then a model for export. This could be a, a model for um, China to kind of deliver to uh, other parts of the world that um, wanted to finally do cities right. Um, and that was what made this space, uh, you know, different from places like Beijing and Shanghai um, that were already built. Uh, and you, you couldn't just add the eco infrastructures to them later, uh, you had to do it first. And so here, what, what mattered was building the infrastructures first and, and not, so much, um, not so much the city. Um, so Guayan, uh, as an administrative space, uh, reimagines the territory of central Guizhou province with an aim to create an integrated governance zone that encompasses portions of the two largest existing cities uh, in the province, but only portions of those focusing on the land uh, in between them. Um, the new area rearranges this administrative space into, uh, as the map on the lower, lower right shows, um, one core and two areas. Um, the core focuses on big data and uh, artificial intelligence development and includes a new university town where most of Guayang's major universities um, have built new campuses. Um, and there's also a massive new high-speed rail station that's uh, been built there. High and leisure residential developments occupy much of the built-up area. Um, and, uh, in, in the core. And then the two other areas outside that core, um, 
the, I guess on the map here, that's the green and the yellow portions um, uh, on the map. Uh, those um, focus on manufacturing clusters and, uh, an, and a, a culture and ecology preservation area featuring cultural heritage and handicraft tourist villages, as well as forest reserves and protected wetlands. The new area is meant to enable a level of coordinated and integrated urban planning that would not have been possible across the region's different and competing um, existing administrative territories. Um, like other urbanizing clusters in China, infrastructures of connectivity and circulation played the central role in defining uh, these new areas. For example, the area's labor market was defined by a one hour commute time that was possible, you know, made possible by the, uh, by the new infrastructures that were being put in place. The new area was defined, in other words, as a space within which one can get to work within an hour. While state level new areas like Guayan can be understood as experimental sites of governance modernization, therefore, uh, this is being achieved as a kind of infrastructural governance, prioritizing horizontal mobility within a gridded network rather than gravitational mobility uh, focusing uh, around a single urban core. Okay, so what's it like to live there? The grid of new roads and the high-speed rail line uh, have introduced local residents to an entirely new scale of interaction with the outside world. But it has also fragmented and unsettled their local geographies as well. On the one hand, for those with their own vehicle, access to new, uh, sorry, access to nearby urban centers has become much easier with all the straight new roads. In addition, new employment opportunities have emerged nearby, including um, a Foxconn plant uh, with more than 20,000 jobs, hospitality positions in the many beautified villages uh, that have become tourism and leisure destinations, and many other service jobs in the industrial clusters uh, or the university town. Uh, this is actually one of uh, the gateway to one of the beautified villages, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, but just what I, what I mean by beautified villages is the villages that, uh, the villages that are not demolished and, and what's happening in Guayan is about um, three fourths of the villages uh, in the new area are being or have been demolished. The ones that remain um, get kind of, uh, get, a, get a facelift makeover so that they look more villagey, um, at least to, in the kind of aesthetic eyes of uh, the urban middle class um, and become kind of tourism and leisure destinations. Uh, with the with the idea being that the farmers who no longer are farming uh, can become uh, tourism leisure tourism and leisure service workers. Um, so a, a, a constant uh, topic of conversation with villagers uh, was that many of them no longer felt compelled to travel to distant cities um, for work, and this was uh, absolutely a great thing as far as they were concerned. Um, the grid had put many. Uh, had put the villages within the Guayang labor market, um, uh, uh, ex uh, meant, meant that the, the vast labor market of, of the city uh, was accessible within a very short commute time uh, if they had means of transportation and if they could access uh, the new highways that were built. Um, so many villagers commented that because of the new roads, uh, they could work in the city and return to the village to take care of parents and children in the evening. And this is, of course, a huge thing in China. One of the most difficult and um, uh, heartbreaking aspects of, of, of development and modernization in China has been um, <clears throat> that a whole generation of children have been growing up in the countryside away from their parents who are working in kind of sweatshop labor conditions in distant cities and leaving the children behind to be taken care of by their grandparents. Um, and so, you know, one of the main goals of creating these kinds of infrastructural spaces is, is to put uh, make accessible uh, uh, a labor market that uh, won't have to go all the way to the coast, for example. Um, and, and, um, and that's a good thing. Um, on the other hand, though, the roads were not always accessible to villagers. In some cases, the villagers had constructed uh, what I call hacker roads, uh, literally cutting through the guardrails of expressways uh, to gain access to a grid that had not been planned, uh, that had been planned with little thought to the accessibility for locals. So um, on this 
uh, let me go back to this image. Um, this is actually a, an informal road that the villagers built themselves. And you can say this is an expressway interchange. And what they've done is they've just kind of cut through this guardrail. And so if you look at this map, um, the road that we're looking at is this one right here. And I don't know if you're in the back, you can see that well, but here's the village. And um, they built the interchange and they didn't build any access to this village. And so they just built their own road and just cut right through there. Um, and so when you, if you want to go to the village, here's the funny thing, if you're coming on the main, this, this one hasn't been finished, right? So no one's going to come on this road. And so typically this is how you would get there, right? You'd, <laughs> you'd come here and then you'd turn off, but no, you can't do that. So you just come along here, you get to this point, you do a U-turn, uh, you hope nobody's coming the other way, but that's probably not going to happen. Uh, and then, and then you get there and it, it works just fine. <laughs> um, but that's a hacker road. And there's several examples of that uh, throughout the new area. Um, and, you know, the local officials are fine with it because even the local, even the higher level officials, they had nothing to do with the, with the building of this highway that was planned by people, you know, in Beijing or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, the villages didn't matter because most of them were going to be demolished anyway. So in addition, what you see on this map is, um, you know, a rural community uh, that uh, what we call in Chinese uh, an administrative village, uh, which consists of all the actual, all the villages that you see in this map are all administratively one site, but they consist of, uh, I think, um, eight different natural villages. And that administrative village found itself divided into four separate parcels um, by two expressways and an interchange that consumed more than half of the arable land. Walking from one village to the next um, thus entailed jumping the guardrails and darting across a six lane highway. Villagers had appealed to the government to build underpasses, which had apparently never been considered when the highways were being built. A local cadre told me that um, they had no say <coughs> uh, in the planning of the highways and had to make do. Most of the villagers I asked indicated that they were happy to be living so close to a new state of the art expressway but accessing their fields was now too dangerous. They would now focus instead on accessing the network. Um, indeed, they had built, uh, you know, the hacker road that connected to the inter inter interchange, and that was far more important to them uh, than the increasingly weed field fields that lay on the other side of the highway, which no one was really that interested in farming anymore. Um, this is a still from a film uh, called The Thousand Year Stage by Daphne Shu, which is a really interesting film that explores uh, the multiple scales and temporalities that come to define the lives of rural people living within the infrastructure space of a national new area. This is not Guayan, this is a different one up further north called Xiong'an. Um, and in uh, her uh, essay about making the film, she writes, um, the insertion of modern high-speed rail stations into empty rural land produces new landscapes across peri-urban China that reflect the messy disjunctures between the spatial and temporal scales of a national infrastructure project, regional economic, uh, regional economic development plan, and village life, each of those um, operating at, uh, at different scales. Focusing on the massive new Baigos uh, high-speed rail station in Chung'an New Area, Xu's film shows the collapsing of scales that occurs when local residents find themselves inhabiting a new space that was designed for urban life to be lived at a speed much faster than village life. This, the vast and empty station plaza ends up being used by villagers as a public space for recreation and for work, uh, work in the form of selling goods and services to the trickle of passengers um, arriving at the station. While the space is designed uh, for a new kind of China speed, that is the pace of life defined by travel on high-speed rail networks, it defines the transience within which locals have come to live their lives, suspended between the different scales of urban and rural life. This messy disjuncture of different spatial and temporal scales has come to define the new landscape of Guayan New Area as well. This is most obviously found in the way multiple scales of transportation infrastructures have been layered on top of each other in recent years. Like Xiong'an, Xiong'an's Baigo Station, Guayan's grid of highways and boulevards is engineered for a different scale of life compared to the older dendritic network of winding lanes and pathways that it has displaced. And that network can be seen here on the left versus the, the newer one on the right. 
One day I was comparing notes on Guayan's landscape with a young professional who had been working in the new area for a couple of years. He commented on how you can read the history of the area by looking at the different layers of transportation infrastructures. Um, and he was fascinated by how each articulated with the other in complex ways. The oldest system of footpaths, then small dirt and later paved roads, trains, then expressways, and now high-speed rail lines. Each one displaced partially what had been there before, he said, but now you have a chaotic accumulation of these transportation types and they don't really fit together. All over China, villagers uh, are facing um, this problem of suddenly being cut off from the world because of the shift in infrastructure. It's a serious problem. Uh, and it's a problem that is, in some ways, uh, for the government at least, um, uh, overcome by the generous compensation packages that um, villagers are offered, um, uh, those that uh, lose their land or villages um, to the development of the new area. Um, Guayan villages, the villagers were very generously compensated, uh, at least relatively speaking. There was an ongoing joke throughout Guizhou um, that everyone wanted to marry a Guayan villager because they were so flush with cash from their compensation. And while some villagers invested their compensation in an apartment closer to the urban core um, to better their entrepreneurial prospects, conversations among locals in Guayan often turned to stories of villagers gambling away their compensation or or buy inexpensive, impractical cars in order to look successful. Local cadres described, it, described efforts to help villagers find more appropriate uses for their compensation. It was telling that many of these involved plugging into the network of mobility that makes up the infrastructure space. Travel was thus uh, a popular option. Villagers had organized group tourist excursions to Beijing and Shanghai and other places. Um, Investing in a truck or a van was easy and transportation and hauling services were ubiquitous. Others invested in a sedan and spent their days driving around the new area on call for Didi Chuxing, um, Chinese version of Uber. While many in Guayan lived lives caught up in the flow of a gridded infrastructure space, uh, they also experienced daily life in increasingly fragmented ways. The space of the new area was itself fragmented by the urban planning policies that governed state, uh, sorry, this one, uh, the governed state, um, uh, state investments uh, and priorities. Guayan was separated into exclusive zones of commercial services, residential communities, industrial clusters, big data server farms, and ecology. In this landscape, villagers were increasingly function, villages were increasingly functional spaces of recreation and leisure. Um, and these are some of the beautified village images, uh, rather than the complex agricultural collect collectivities that they once were. Such villages became a uh, little more than beautified displays of themselves with high-tech high -tech facades um, that included filtered drinking water fountains or unmanned guest houses for tourists where you check in by scanning a QR code. Specialization and market niche came to define these rural spaces. Uh, one village had converted itself as, uh, into a virtual reality theme park. Another uh, served as a summer destination for retirees escaping from the heat in places like Chongqing and Wuhan. But most villages were simply housing a new service, um, a new class of service labor, providing manual workers uh, wherever they were needed throughout the new area, including the university town where higher education campuses were staffed and maintained by former villagers and where students uh, consumed a steady diet of village prepared noodles, barbecue, and other snacks. In some ways, the infrastructure space of Guayan had transformed the Guayzhou countryside into an operational landscape of service provision for an urbanizing middle class. As Tadiar has argued in a different context, such landscapes depend on grids of roads and highways, uh, the infrastructures of circulation, to bring the, quote, vital infrastructure of a newly displaced service class to these sites where labor adds value to the trans-territorial city. Meanwhile, just uh, most of the white collar workers in Guayan commuted there from their homes in, central, in the central city center. Uh, while the government wanted to see more of these workers relocate to the new area, the infrastructure grid made it possible for them to reach the new area from anywhere in the provincial capital uh, in under an hour. And so they were very uh, unmotivated to move to an empty new space. 
Now, workers I talked to invariably commuted at least 45 minutes each way to reach their office jobs in Guayon, uh, and only about 20% lived in relocation apartments that they rented from the villagers uh, in the area. Their, their experience was testament uh, to the way the infrastructure space focuses on circulation and mobility rather than settlement. Commercial housing has been de-emphasized. Um, jobs first, then housing, one planner told me. Um, network was emphasized over node. Okay, so starting to wind down here. Um, the condition of suspension has been observed by scholars who draw attention not only to the spatial fragmentations that often result from large scale infrastructure projects, but also their temporal ruptures as well. Um, Gupta has argued, for example, that instead of being understood as a temporary state between the start of a project and its completion, suspension needs to be theorized as its, um, as its own uh, condition of being. The temporality of suspension is not between past and future, between beginning and end, but constitutes its own ontic condition just as surely as does completion. Building on this, Carson Nees argue for a processual understanding of infrastructure's normal state as one of unfinishedness. Being finished, uh, they point out, is illusory. This leads them to suggest that we think pluralistically about the multiple temporalities of infrastructure that exist for planners, for workers, for displaced villagers, officials, or tourists. Um, so what am I talking about when I talk about Guayan as an unfinished um, space, as an indeterminate space that always promises to become a city and, ne ever, and yet never will be? Um, as far as the state is concerned, the roads are finished. There's no unfinishedness about these incredible roads that have been built. Um, they have arrived, and very quickly. So this is not an issue of the unfinishedness of roads, but it is an issue of roads creating the condition of unfinishedness for the area as a whole. As an infrastructure space, Guayan is inherently incomplete, and it is incomplete by design. In Guayan, it is not so much um, an infrastructural delay that constitutes the condition of suspension, but rather the comprehensive infrastructural space itself. That is, and to be deliberately provocative, suspension here is the intended outcome of what Governor, uh, Governor and St. Pierre have called China's infrastructuring, in which lives of settlement and deposition are permanently disrupted by mobility and suspension, making access to the network the new condition by which one's life chances are measured. I've been arguing that we come to understand this condition by pursuing um, an infrastructural analytic. Uh, infrastructure space then is um, productive of mobility as a norm rather than an aberration in life. This is in the end what indeterminacy does. It may be a powerful force fueling the ever, ever receding promise of the city to come, but meanwhile it compels us to take to the road. Of course, migration, uh, particularly from impoverished rural places to urban centers, has for decades been the primary means of improving one's livelihood for millions of people in China. Uh, to be mobile, Marian Dreisen has commented, referring to Chinese labor migrants in Ethiopia, is a coveted way of life, a cultural imperative, and a means of crafting a fulfilling future. Such mobility, she points out, is driven by insecurity and dispossession and the social pressure of securing a stable new life. She writes, only by migrating are they able to stake claim to social presence in a rapidly developing Chinese society in order to achieve a feeling of belonging as well as a sense of dignified personhood. They are compelled to be and remain on the move. This then is the condition of suspension that has been brought to residents of Guayan New Area. They don't have to go to Ethiopia <laughs> to experience it. What has changed is that this condition is no longer one that a villager enters by leaving the countryside for some distant urban center or some construction project abroad, but is now constituted within the infrastructure space that villagers now find themselves living in. So let me just step, try to step back a little bit from China <laughs> um, with some broader uh, thoughts or implications um, and, and start that with you know, the question of, you know, is China exporting a new urban, uh, a new post-urban model of development? Um, is the indeterminacy of the Belt and Road infrastructures 
leading to conditions of suspension throughout Eurasia? Mm, perhaps, but I don't think that these are answerable questions, really. My talk is less about a particular China model than it is about an analytical approach that foregrounds both the spatial and temporal fragmentations produced by infrastructure as a socio-technical assemblage with political effects. Um, you know, clearly the Shenzhen model or the Shekou model of fast urbanism has been bandied about as Chinese capital courts clients for city building projects throughout the global south. Um, China has become the uh, perhaps infamous home of the urban speed machine, um, as at least some scholars have referred to it. And so it's perhaps not surprising that most of China's major partner states in the Belt and Road Initiative are pursuing major city building projects in partnership with Chinese real estate developers and construction companies. We see this in Myanmar with uh, the New Yangon project, Cambodia with Diamond City, Malaysia's Forest City, uh, Boten in, in Laos and many others, just to name a few. While all, of, while all of these ventures have promised a future city that will be built at great speed, all of them also qualify as half finished, uh, perhaps perpetually so. But I'm not particularly interested actually in labeling these projects as characteristic of a Chinese, uh, of, a, of a distinctive China model of development. China is certainly not the only development actor selling dream cities uh, to local power brokers with some cash to spend. And even these Chinese projects typically involve a consortium of local and other international firms. But instead I'm working toward a broader conceptual and analytical approach that has been uh, energized by the growing presence of Chinese capital on the global development stage. That approach focuses on the infrastructures themselves and seeks out the technopolitical effects of their materialization in both spatial and temporal dimensions. In, in Guayan, those effects are evident in the unevenness of connectivity and in the fragmentation of daily life as people navigate and negotiate the indeterminacy of infrastructure mm -hmm. space. The network of new highways uh, in this space of simultaneous connection and blockage, plowing through fields and hills with nothing but contempt for the vagaries, vagaries of life held there, yet also offering an escape route and a pathway to potential wealth never before seen or even imagined in these places. The network promises flow and circulation, not settlement. For this ultimately is what the new area suggests, an infrastructure space encouraging continuous suspension rather than precipitation or deposition. And, um, and I'll just end with a quote from, another quote from Lefebvre, and sorry to end on such a morose note, but <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, in his essay, Notes on the New Town, Lefebvre mediate, uh, meditated on this sense of suspension, even though writing of a very different time and place than the peri-urban regions of China. He wrote, here in the new town, boredom is pregnant with desires, frustrated frenzies, unrealized possibilities. A magnificent life is waiting just around the corner and far, far away. It is waiting like the cake is waiting when there's no butter, uh, when there's butter milk, flour, and sugar. This is the realm of freedom. It's an empty realm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, this it was really, really wonderful, great presentation, and and also I, I provoked at least many thoughts <laughs> in in my case, but I, I I hope also in the audience. Um, um, we actually now have. In, sorry, the microphone. Okay. Yes. Okay. So so we could. Uh, before before um, letting all of you <laughs> to ask questions and comments, so we, we have invited um, uh, uh, Phil Wilcox uh, to comment on on uh, on Tim's presentation. Uh, Phil, are you are you are you there? Yes. Um, so Phil Wilcox, you can. There is a problem, apparently. No? 
can you enable her to to turn on? Okay, while we are waiting, so I can just say that at, at uh, Phil Wilcox is a research associate at at Bielefeld University, uh, Germany, in the Faculty of Sociology, and and she has done work in Southeast Asia, particularly uh, in Laos, and and studied Laos society and politics, and and um, has been currently uh, focusing focusing on the in intensifying Chinese engagement in Laos and the change in perceptions of China in Laos as well. And and she has worked, for example. On that, on, and examined that that very project that was in one one of, of Tim's slides of um, the, that Lao China Railway project. So I, I think Bill is very familiar with that one, <laughs> um, uh, and that's one of the major Belt and Road Initiative projects in 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 Laos. So, um, so Phil, <laughs> you're most welcome to 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 share share your comments. Comments and I guess here we do also this kind of bridging, perhaps from from China also to the kind of overseas Chinese <laughs> projects. Perhaps let's see. Okay, but Phil, you're welcome. I will do my best. Thank you so much and good morning everybody from Germany. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much to Tim for such an inspiring and insightful opening keynote. I'm sure that's given everyone a really energizing introduction to the conference and there are some wonderful rich themes in there, which I know we will be picking up on further and discussing later today and tomorrow. For now, because there was so much to draw on there, I'm already very much looking forward to the Q&A and I feel extremely privileged to have the opportunity to make some remarks on what we just heard, although knowing where to start was a little bit challenging. So I found it really helpful then to think about the underlying and cross-cutting themes here, and I'm sure it will, be, will come as a surprise to nobody that from there I personally find myself getting to a series of questions, many of which were already raised very clearly. What are cities or urban spaces? What are they for? What are they really about? What is modernity supposed to look like? Is a city actually ever finished? Does it really matter? Who should or would build a future to look like what exactly? What about the gaps between expectations and reality? And what does all that have to do with infrastructure? And I think after the keynote, the answer to that last question is, well, really quite a bit. And the title of the speech really makes me think and think at some length ever since I was invited to deliver these comments just out of reach, who gets to reach what? I come from an anthropology background. When, how, with whom, for whom? And I think that actually speaks very nicely to the themes of the overall conference and also speaks to the notion of, of thinking of urbanization as social process and cities as physical manifestations of those social processes. Now, before I get much further into this, I just want to pause for a minute to chew over a really basic question. When we listen to the sort of space that Tim described, just what are these places in our individual and collective imaginations? Not rural, not quite urban. And I find myself thinking here a lot of Jonathan Rigg and his work on how a division between urban and rural is an increasingly problematic one in an interconnected world. But the notion of an urban space that is not quite finished definitely needs a less wordy term. Semantics aside though, it's a very good question and worth chewing over. And I find the notion of infrastructure or infrastructural space as an alternative term, something I'd love to delve into further. And here's another question as a sort of spin-off from that, when we talk about what these spaces are and how we can or should understand them. And that is whether these spaces really are urban spaces with Chinese characteristics and how such spaces might vary or not across the world. Perhaps that's another absolutely fascinating discussion. We know well from the infrastructure literature that infrastructures are rarely, if ever, about the physical object, but about the connections or disconnections people make through infrastructures and the meanings placed on the objects. So what then do they represent? What are they supposed to represent for, by and to whom? And in his recent book on borderland infrastructures, Alessandro Reaper has pointed out that infrastructure and development are synonymous in the Chinese context. You simply can't have one without the other. And that's also relevant for thinking about infrastructures 
in terms of wider agendas and priorities of development and future building. Indeed, when we think of Belt and Road, particularly around connectivities, it's important to think again of infrastructures, not what they are, but what they represent to different people, both individually and cumulatively. And while the same argument can and should be made for hydropower projects financed by the World Bank and so on, my personal interest has always been in transport infrastructures. Such schemes also talk of what Reeves helpfully termed infrastructural hope and the intricacy of whose hope makes investigating these sort of questions so much more worthwhile. And this allows us to view ideas of the future as individual and collective projects, as well as making us confront questions about what sort of role people have with the state in future building and the limits of individual and collective agencies. But while infrastructures are often said or presented as representing development, progress, modernity, and all that sounds positive, aspirational and great and so on, later on today we'll hear from Tania Murray Lee who will link this to, to infrastructural violence or what I guess we could term the downsides of infrastructures and points to who loses as a result of infrastructure schemes. And as we see in numerous examples of people dispossessed, sometimes with quite extreme forms of violence, some people are losing a lot. And that also links to some of the points speakers in the various working groups will pick up on. We know that fine well that in building a future through infrastructures, some will win and some will lose out, even if such initiatives are billed as being good for the community, nation, individual, and so on. What then is erased, reinterpreted, presented and re-presented in building new urban spaces, cities, infrastructures, and so on. And my own work in Laos focuses heavily on infrastructure and development and vice versa. I've heard a lot over the years about how people feel about infrastructure schemes, especially China-backed infrastructure schemes, often in ways that are contradictory, in that people articulate often deeply held positive and just as deeply held negative sentiments at the same time. And that again speaks nicely to the idea of doubleness or dual quality um, and how these sorts of projects for future building have this dual quality. It also explains why some people may support, or at least say they support, processes of change that they also know that ultimately they may lose out in. And underneath that, perhaps going off at a little personal tangent here, is a more fundamental question for me, which is why development? Because if that doesn't come out of nothing, I find myself thinking more and more about a drive for development per se, and what non-development might look like. That would seem inalienable to those who regard development as a must. One of the things that came out to me very clearly from what Tim has said, is the importance of viewing development, urbanism, urban change as a process, not as an endpoint. In building urban spaces at speed and viewing them as half finished or never finished, that can also obscure something more important. Namely, the notion of what they could become is worth considering in and of itself. And while um, reading to his speech, which I was very privileged to see a few days ahead, I found myself asking what sounded like a rather painfully obvious question, which is, how do we actually even know when something is finished and does that actually matter? Is it when it's developed, whatever that means, is it a plethora of places for leisure consumption that we've heard are sometimes viewed as a marker of modernity in urban China? Is it, as some of my interlocutors in Laos have mentioned, um, when fewer people work in the rice fields and get a basic education in an education system that functions efficiently? Or perhaps more visibly, when there is a public transport system akin to what many Lao students have seen when they travel outside the Lao border. Oh, Phil, China is developed. There are metro systems, is something I've heard a lot. And something Lao students told me repeatedly as we took rides on a city's public bus network in urban China one sunny Saturday afternoon for, I guess, consumption of and to be wowed by infrastructure that does not yet exist in Laos. And I also guess a fun and relatively cheap thing to do on a weekend afternoon. This makes me think again of the lived experience of living in what we have heard termed as infrastructure spaces. It also demonstrates something of the contested nature of development and how that term is often used in, in the abstract without qualification as to what it might actually mean to different people. 
But if such things as education, healthcare, housing, public, private transport are markers of development, they are about as vague as they are broad. And that is, to me, a really, really important point in and of itself. And I would suggest that how infrastructure and infrastructure spaces are understood has a lot to do with possibility. And here I'm returning to, uh, to the starting point of the keynote just to tie this up. Dreams, aspirations are durable, but also elusive. And last year I was delighted to review Johnson's new book, Mekong Dreaming, Life and Death Along a Changing River. And I found myself thinking about why the power of possibility is so important and how it is elusive, that idea of the possibility, but also has very real world effects in everyday life. And for me, possibilities are fascinating in their potency, but so too is what is held out as what the future could look like to different people. What is just about within reach? What could be uh, dreamed about, aspired to, and strived for, or could be. And that is what we heard, heard termed as the promise of the ideal city, which has a tantalizing quality ever suspended. So for now, it's high time for me to stop talking and let's move on to the q and I'd like to thank Tim again for such an inspiring opening speech and the organizers for inviting me to make these comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil, and, and thank you for your <laughs> inspiring comments and, and also for making those, those various connections there. Um, I don't know, Tim, do you want to immediately perhaps well, somehow I, I, react or I respond? Mean, I just to, want to thank, to Phil, for, thank Phil for those comments. Um, that, that's great. There's, there's a lot of different threads that, uh, she's, that uh, have been pulled up there, um, and I, I've been thinking about whether or not I, there's something I can add to kind of help um, uh, pull some of those uh, further out or not. But um, let me keep thinking about that a little bit more. And uh, maybe we can just go to some of the some of the questions for now and see how that goes. OK, OK. Um, so we have, I see at least one one question in the chat. <laughs> But um, we could we could maybe take here first questions. I have also some questions in mind, but maybe we give privilege <laughs> to our audience here. Okay, you can yeah. So maybe we take a couple of questions here from the floor, and then then if you want to respond to those, and then we can take questions from from the Zoom. Uh, Yes, um, I'm Taru Salmenkari from Helsinki University, and I would um, like to ask about another kind of um, structure in China. So in, there's infrastructure and um, uh, kind of bringing urban things to the countryside. But at the same time, there is who call. There is a policy that um, people who are from the countryside cannot settle in the cities. And uh, I would like to get your comments about these two things. So before I've been thinking that this infrastructure can never work because it think, it, there is a thinking that it brings what Huko would bring like good education and things like that to the countryside that, uh, that is uh, concentrated in cities because of the Huko. And it's not coming with them, even if a village looks like um, a, a urban place. But then uh, you brought a little bit different kind of um, angle to this to say that there is this uh, one hour connectivity that actually could bring some of the benefits um, with infrastructure building only. So if you could um, comment a little bit about this, please. Yeah, yeah. Sure, uh, that's great. I mean, the Hukou is a, an incredibly important you know, institution and very much uh, a critical part of this whole story. Um, and I can't really kind of cover all the different dimensions of that. But um, one of the things that's been happening, I mean, you're right that, you know, for a long time, uh, the ideal of kind of acquiring the urban Hukou for rural migrants was was kind of the gold, <laughs> the golden grail, uh, the, you know, that, that, that would enable them to um, become bona fide urban citizens and uh, to be able to um, uh, uh, claim the rights uh, and, and, and um, 
you know, of, of, of what, what, what normal urban, ci urban citizens get in terms of, you know, healthcare and education and, and just a sense of, of, of respect and, and not, be, not being second-class citizens in their own country. That has, that, you know, that, that has shifted somewhat. I mean, there's still quite a bit of that in China, but at the same time, um, as more and more cities are, you know, accessible in, in, in this way through these infrastructures, um, the, uh, the idea of kind of resettling into urban areas is a little less um, the goal now. And um, it still is for many, but for many others, there's a, a real sense that um, they don't want to give up their rural hukou status because to do so means that they've relinquished any claim on land um, that they might have. And the precariousness um, of living in the city means that uh, relinquishing that land puts you in a very uh, vulnerable position that, um, and, and that vulnerability is increasingly apparent to, to people. So and now we have a kind of a different political system situation um, in which in places like Guayan, um, everybody, when, they're, when their village is demolished, everyone uh, gets to have urban huko uh, status. Um, and many don't want it. And, many, uh, and then you have a political contestation uh, with villagers refusing to accept urban huko because in their mind, it, it's like a contract. And they've said, um, I agree to become a, basically an urban cis citizen and thereby don't have any ground to stand on for um, ask, uh, demanding higher compensation or more adequate compensation for the land that's been expropriated. Um, and so Huko is still very relevant, but it's, it's relevant now and it, it's producing a kind of a, almost the flip side of the coin, a different kind of politics around um, uh, a sense that if everybody is now urban Huko um, and there's no more land, then we, uh, you know, that proletarianization um, is 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 a is a is a serious increasingly regarded as a serious problem for visitors. So yeah, that's one important dimension of what's going on now. Thanks for that question. Okay, thanks so much, Professor Oaks. That was really fascinating. Um, I'm a really big fan of your work. Um, I also do my research in Guizhou, or my PhD research was there. Um, I in a very different region, Rongjiang. So uh -huh. uh, zoned out um, the village where I do my research um, is zoned out as a heritage site. So in a very uh -huh. different context than what you're talking about. But um, again, why your previous a, a Dong village? Or? Yes. Yeah. So okay. why your previous uh, research has been very helpful for me in my thinking process. Um, this was also really fascinating. It made me think a lot about Nick Smith's uh, research, the idea of the end of the village yeah. and the rural urban coordination and along peri-urban regions of Chongqing. Um, I'm not a, I'm not so aware of the policy here, but it, I did think about is the same terminology being used in in Guayan. Um, but I really like how you've gone beyond, you know, um, I mean, the idea of what Nick Smith is writing about, which I know you're not trying to do because it's really dangerous grounds when we do say that urban and rural are blurring as as you just responded that they're not because very much because of the Huko system, mm -hmm. but rather um, it's through the planning that the kind of the urban um, scholars, insight on villages and their incentives of of the idyllic village that is the urbanization process um, but i really like how you've gone beyond that and looked at the infrastructures on its own and it also reminded me a lot about the kind of visceral experience of moving around guizhou like when you're nearing a heritage site just the smoothness of the roads like you know after a long day of travel eventually the the car stops bumping so much and you can kind of re rest back and relax but they're empty roads yeah. you know exactly as your photo showed you might see a cow here and there but it's not roads for the villages so um you i think you really portrayed that um very realistically i was i was um i, I had a question mark with the quote, I, I think I missed who it was who, who said this, if it was an urban planner or someone, you, um, you know, some government official you were engaging with. Um, it was the quote about uh, roads are making villagers um, being left out, being cut off from the world. And I think the quote said something that um, there's a disconnection here. Yeah. And I was wondering, where, so, you know, from that standpoint, who they see it as a disconnection. And I think maybe this is what Phil was talking about as well. Um, do the, I mean, the villagers maybe don't see it as a disconnection. As you said, they, they see that road, that highway as prestige for them, and they probably recognize it's not for them. They, they don't want to pay that highway fee. They have their own roads to go down, go down anyway. 
So, and it also, you know, it's that whole idea of the historical portrayal of Cuello as you, as you started the lecture out from 17th century. Yeah. Um, quote by Xu Xiaoke that, you, you know, you open your door the first thing in the morning, it's a mountain. This is the same quote being repeated continuously, even alongside these big highways and, yeah. and train stations. So I was just wondering from that perspective, you know, looking at the, the planners or, you know, sorry, again, I missed out who it was, but this kind of scholarly viewpoint is that a kind of urbanism being imposed, this kind of um, not recognizing that actually the villagers know they've been cut off um, throughout history or is, you know, am I, am I being too pessimistic here? And my second question was near the end of your presentation, you used, well, you, I mean, throughout the presentation, there was this theme of suspension. Yeah. And it made me think a lot about Xiang Biao's work. Um, of course, he uses Xuan Fu um, suspension kind of to refer to, oh, it's kind of picked up as a zeitgeist, you know, across Chinese society. It's fantastic how it's, it's allowing for conversation amongst the public, basically youth and, and migrant workers saying, hey, I feel like I'm in a, center, in a state of suspension. I feel trapped. But what Xiang Biao was also saying is that this notion of suspension, basically he's comparing to the hum hummingbird that's frantically trying to move its wings, but can't, can't get out of it. Yeah. So he's saying that this, is, this comes down to the very workings of the low rungs of government, that you know, it's, it's, it's a continuous repetition of these government officials basically hopping from project to project because they're suspended. They, they don't have you know, they, then there's the outcome of phase projects, as you showed as well, these kind of short-term solutions. So rather than being able to engage in a long-term project, they're suspended. I was just wondering if Xiang Biao's work has been helpful um, for you to work on, to, to think about these ideas. Yeah, but great. thank you. I thought that was really fantastic. And it's great, great to have you in Helsinki. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. It's great to be here. And thanks for all those thoughts. Um, there's a lot there. In those questions, uh, so I, I can't really do justice to all the nuance of, of the questions that you've that you've asked, and um, and it's great to hear that you worked in uh, in Rongjiang. I'll just start with, uh, you know, I did um, back when I was doing my dissertation. I worked in Jiaoxing uh, down near there, and um, you know, it, back then it was a two day journey <laughs> to get to Jiaoxing from Guiyang, and uh, now it's like what an hour on the high speed rail because it's a train station right near there, and so. Um, that area where you work is also fundamentally you know, transformed, as you mentioned, by, by these new connect, connective infrastructures. And, and yet, if you are, uh, you know, if you are in a village that um, has been kind of passed over by the high-speed rail or something, and yet the train station is still a half a day's journey away, your, your sense of blockage by these uh, infrastructures might also be just as, as, as great. Um, and so, you know, you're, your first question um, kind of pertains to that that issue of of um, I guess ambivalence uh, that uh, uh, villagers um, express to me. Maybe it's not ambivalence as much as just this. They're they're very practiced at resignation, <laughs> um, at just you know well you know whatever comes our way we'll deal with it. You know that's what we've always done. Uh, we'll make the best of it, or you know, we'll build a hacker road, or or not, or we'll we'll do whatever we've always done. But that's just who we are and what what we do. Um, that that sense of um, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with us. We're <laughs> we're just here trying to make the best of of it. And and on the one hand, it's remarkable remarkable to me um, how consistently they always do kind of make the best of it. Um, uh, rather than, um, and maybe I'll go out on a limb a little bit here, rather than kind of saying, I have a right to, <laughs> to being connected on my own terms and, you know, and I'm, I'm really pissed off about this. And there is, there is some of that, but by far the majority of responses is like, well, you know, here we go again. Let's just figure out how to work with the situation that we've been given. Um, there have been some studies done, uh, and none in Guizhou that I've seen, but there have been studies done in Yunnan um, among Chinese geographers, um, published in Chinese, that have um, done, tried to map uh, quantita quantitatively the um, impact that new um, high-speed rail and expressways have had on connection times for villages. And um, they've been arguing that uh, the, while some places are, <laughs> are much more connected, 
um, they've been arguing that uh, on balance, the result is, is negative for much of the countryside, that, um, that it, it's now more, it's, that it's more disruptive um, and, and that there's actually more blockage now with the kind of um, concentrated effect of high speed rail and the concentrations of kind of limited access highways uh, means that the, actually the majority of the countryside is less connected now than, than before um, because of the limited access. Um, and while those articles don't go to the next level, I would say that's in some ways by design um, as well, uh, because it's part of a larger campaign to kind of concentrate population um, away from dispersed settlement and into more urbanized rural kinds of um, uh, uh, settlements. And so that, I think that's happening and that's what you see happening in Guayana as well. They, they, they want all those villages to disappear so that, so that it can really, um, uh, you know, um, and, and so by, by creating that infrastructure of connectivity, um, that, that's one of the outcomes um, that happens. But um, the, the, the person you referred to, the quote, that was just, uh, he was not a planner. He was uh, just a white collar professional working for the government in the new area. Um, I knew him because he was a former student um, at the university where I was a guest professor for a while. And so that was my connection to him. And we were having this conversation where I was talking about my research and he was just saying, yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I've kind of been thinking about how um, when, when a, whenever a new, uh, a new kind of infrastructure gets laid down on the landscape, it doesn't quite line up with what was there before. Um, and, and, and the way that then it's up to the villagers to kind of work out how to articulate them together. Um, and again, they just figure it out, you know. Um, and I, but I think he, he was not a rural person. He was uh, kind of an urban white collar kind of middle class worker, but um, he, he had spent enough time there to, to kind of understand that. And so I don't know if that quite gets at that, that first question, but, um, but let me move on to Xiang Biao. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, I mean, Xiang Biao's work is fantastic. I, I, I really love what he's done and, and what he's, part of what he's been working with on this idea of suspension is, is, is kind of to say that, you know, yeah, he, he, he said, yeah, I've, I've played a role in kind of introducing this keyword um, into the lexicon of how people kind of process and make sense of their lives um, in China today, but I don't, you know, it's taken on a life of its own and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so part of his work has just been to kind of track those different uh, ways that it articulates something. Um, and I really like the way he's very deliberately trying to kind of um, de-emphasize the role of an elite, you know, scholar to, in, in that, in that um, and to kind of privilege uh, the ways, the vernacular ways that people have kind of worked with um, that term and, and those ideas. But I guess when I was, you know, reading a lot of what he'd written about it, my sense was that it was predominantly kind of focusing on the experience of also, you know, migrants themselves who um, basically say, you know, yeah, I'm going to put, I'm going to put my life on hold in order to kind of achieve a certain, um, you know, I'm going to work really hard in a factory or do whatever I have to do and, and suffer. And, and this is not a life. Um, my, my life is actually suspended until I get to a point where I can live a life. But, I, but in order to do that, I have to kind of work in this, in this environment or, you know, do what I need to do to, to, to um, put life, to, to get to a point where I can actually live life. Um, and, I, you know, I, I've tried to think about this in a little bit different way um, in that um, I've been kind of taken up by the metaphor of particles in suspension, um, where you think about, you know, I think about the fact that, um, you know, you've got sediment, sed uh, in it, you, you've got soil particles in a river, like the Yellow River, as it flows onto the North China Plain from the Los Plateau, it's full of silt. Uh, and, and as the river float, slows down, you have the deposition of that sediment onto the, onto the bed of the river. And so the bed of the river is always coming up and then eventually the river finds a new channel. Um, and so I, I, I think of that, metaphor um, as kind of a way of thinking about the infra infrastructure space is kind of always always maintaining that flow. So that deposition doesn't happen um, because the flow is what is going to kind of 
keep the economic system, keep capital going, keep a keep a keep the the vital infrastructure, as as Nefertiti uh, Tadier calls it, um, available to um, the new kinds of um, uh, uh, the new kinds of uh, economic activities um, that are being uh, promoted in China. Um, they need to be supported by uh, a class of labor that needs to always be in permanent suspension. And so it intersects with what Xiang Biao is, is talking about, but I've, but I've been focusing a little bit more on um, the kind of the intentionality of that in relationship to um, kind of an, an emerging system of, well, there's been plenty of exploitation in Chinese capitalism, but um, the way that that has been morphing into something quite uh, a little bit different. If that makes sense. But thanks, thanks for all that. Yeah. That was that was very wonderful, and it is great that Sylvie was actually here because I think you could go into details. There are not, not that many mm -hmm. of us who are actually so much tuned into <laughs> into into what's going on in your research areas. But um, I don't know. There is at least one question here in the chat, but I don't know if there was something more in the audience. We are Didn't also, of course. I was also thinking to also ask still something maybe about this, making these connections between the China and the overseas <laughs> things, but Nikhil. That would be great, yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Tim. I really uh, enjoyed the talk, uh, a lot to think with. Um, and particularly resonant, I think, was the argument about how um, infrastructure provision is a way of doing urban without planning or mm -hmm. despite planning, urban planning. Uh, it was very resonant with what I'm seeing in in India as well. And, and here I was interested in this juncture between the different palimpsests of infrastructures um, that you described, particularly between urban planners and road builders or rail builders, right? Um, so in the initial rendering of Guyan um, as a plan or vision for the city, the, the road was not very prominent in the very quick like um, view that I had of it. Um, but the next slide foregrounded the city's um, highway um, infrastructure as, as a primary organizing node or network, I guess, not node, um, for the city's form. So can you say a little bit about how that happened in Guyan? Um, are the different scales of state action and the disjunctures and the controversy that might have ensued between planners and the roads proponents or the roads boosters? Um, yeah. To what extent was that a controversy or was it just like laid over, you know? Yeah, I mean, question. you know, urban planning in China is is famously, um, you know, aspirational. Uh, it, it plays uh, less a role of kind of guiding what's going to happen as it does um, its primary role is really selling what that future vision might be. Um, and not so much to, well, partly to, for example, middle-class buyers of high-end housing might uh, be interested to see what a planner's vision of this space is, is looking like. Um, but more importantly, uh, selling that uh, space to, to higher level officials um, who uh, might release more funding, who might be promoting the local leaders and those kinds of things. Um, so the planning works um, in, an, in a, uh, you know, Wu Fulong has written quite a bit about, about this in, in the Chinese context as, as something that kind of promotes um, in an ex post facto kind of way what's already um, being built. And so the, the construction of the roads and the high-speed rail line um, that kind of define the infrastructure space in my, in my reading of it, um, those all precede in many ways the plan. And the plan ends up then kind of working around that or kind of figuring out, well, how do we make an elegant kind of <laughs> version of, of something out of what seems to be being built? And while that sounds a little bit weird, you know, the, the planning, the people, you know, there's, there's no connection between them and the, the construction people. You know, the construction people, are, they're just going to do what they do. They've got a national plan um, that, they've, that they've figured out. It's all kind of laid out from Beijing. These, these major highways are, are national level uh, highways. The high-speed rail network, of course, is, is national level. Um, locals might, you know, hear where it's going to go. <laughs> or they might not. Um, and they just kind of like the villagers, they're just like, well, we'll just work with what we've got. But the planners 
play this really, you know, role of then trying to kind of create this comprehensive vision around what seems to be built. But often, um, what ends up getting built is then, you know, quite different from any kind of plan, and the plan has to always, you know, then be adjusted. So there's a real disconnect um, there. And like I said, I think the, the plan really um, becomes more of a uh, the kind of the equivalent of the architectural rendering, <laughs> um, and, and the way that that uh, brands and sells a project more than kind of determines a regulation or you know determines what can go where um, or anything like that. If that makes if, yeah 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 thanks <laughs> that is great. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking this is, might not be a very great question, but I was just thinking about the difference between the uh, Shenzhen and, and this Buyan, as if you think that the Shenzhen has been the, the kind of already for a long time, the kind of, okay, this is the export the model. The Shenzhen, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then when, and then compared with the, with the Buyan or what you were <laughs> presenting yeah. here and, yeah. and how it was mentioned that, that that's also seen as that there is that kind of potential for or this export <laughs> export yeah. but how so do, what do you think what are the the main i mean you you perhaps pointed a bit to that but what what are the main perhaps differences be, between them and then i was also thinking something that because i i really it, this made me think a lot this this okay the difference between infrastructure space and city and the circulation versus settlements and but then also this because I've been stuck maybe too much with this enclave, enclave mode of, <laughs> of China model. And then if you think that how Guiyan yeah. is actually somehow perhaps part even of, opposite, <laughs> opposite an en yeah. enclave model. Yeah. And, and, and it's supposed to be more this mode of connections and, and, and the infrastructural space of, of, of this kind of circulation. But can it end up at least to start with this kind of yeah. enclave model when it's <laughs> exported right, or, right. or or not or how 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 perhaps also we might need to rethink this yeah. enclave yeah, model. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, I mean, just to start with the enclave model. Um, yeah, there that is um, a, a very powerful narrative about mm. um, what China has been doing abroad and and. Um, and I think uh, it's it's a narrative that doesn't really hold up that well when you look at what's actually going on on the ground. And, and most of the research on that has been done in Africa, except more than more than Southeast Asia. But and and perhaps it maybe holds up a little bit better in Southeast Asia than it than it has in in Africa. But there's all sorts of ways that um, the idea of of uh, the enclave model hasn't really panned out empirically. Um, but going back to Shenzhen, I mean, uh, you know, the Shenzhen is an is a really fascinating kind of case because in many ways Shenzhen is completely unique. I mean, Shenzhen, the, the conditions that made Shenzhen possible as the kind of place that it is, this kind of overnight <laughs> metropolis that, that grew out of nothing, um, that was wildly successful, that becomes this global center of not just uh, export manufacturing, but ultimately design and, and, and high tech. Um, you know, most of China's high tech firms and and uh, most of China's most powerful real estate development um, companies have also come out of, of, of Shenzhen. Anyway, the, the conditions that made Shenzhen possible are, are, are unique historically and spatially. Um, uh, to, uh, to, and, and, and don't really translate into anything that's exportable. Um, and yet, um, the success of Shenzhen has become uh, not just something that People um, in large, you know, large parts of the world, parts of the global South, look to as kind of this is what China can can bring to us. If they can do something like a Shenzhen, they can, you know, they can do um, something like that for us. And the Ch and Chinese, um, maybe you know, when we say the Chinese have promoted this idea of Shenzhen as an export model, what do we mean by that? It's um, there's all these different actors <laughs> involved in this, and 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 um, the Shen, <laughs> Shenzhen-based construction firms that might profit from 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 saying uh, we can build you our own, your your own version of Shenzhen um, might be also kind of promoting that idea of Shenzhen as a model, even though you know overall um, that might not be coming out of Beijing, if if you know what I mean the the, the idea of model. But but I guess what I'm trying to say is that. Um, uh, Shenzhen has remained a very powerful rhetorical kind of tool 
that China has been happy to take advantage of in kind of selling the idea of, um, you know, yeah, we can build you a city. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can bring China's speed um, to your place. What I'm trying to point out by looking at Guian um, in more detail is to kind of just um, emphasize how you've got, um, and this is why I went back to Lefebvre in this kind of talking about urbanization as a social process versus the city as a spatial manifestation of, uh, of as a material manifestation of that social process. The, the next thing that Lefebvre says in that conversation is that the city is not only a spatial manifestation of that social process, but it's an ideological element as well. The um, urbanization as a social process is just doing what it does. Um, but the city, the vision of the city, the idea of the city becomes ideological um, because it does certain kind of work um, uh, for, for, for capital. And that really strikes me as, as interesting. Here we have the, the idea of Shenzhen as, a, you know, as a complete kind of uh, almost utopian uh, city um, playing that same role. Um, and so I'm just trying to kind of point out the contrast that when we pay more attention to the infrastructure, we see the, <laughs> I think we see the, um, the starkness by which that ideology is, is being constructed. No that is. getting a <laughs> little music accompaniment. <laughs> it's it's like the radio shows when you know you run out of time and they yeah, start I think to play that's the music. Actually the sign. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but but I don't know where it comes from. But yes, anyways, it's there. Okay, it's well. But maybe do we have something in the? Uh, do you think actually? I don't mind the music. It's fine. Uh, but do we yeah, want because to? I think we, we are actually reaching maybe that point that we, we could end our, our, okay. our plenary session and, and, and go for, for a break. We have one question here that was, that was but I think we have, uh, you have been addressing it from, from different things because there is a question of, of, uh, about the infrastructural uh, changes and, and, and what they kind of make possible and enable and what they prevent, constrain or obscure on the other, other hand. And, and uh, in addition to mobilities and connectivities that um, if there are something related to work, livelihoods, cultivation, healthcare, family relations and, and community building and, and, and so forth. But so long, maybe, yeah, you're reading it. But maybe perhaps if, you, if that provokes still an, a, a kind of final thought <laughs> that you want to share with us, but then otherwise I'll just go now and see what's happening with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the question uh, uh, is picking up on, um, well, for me, I guess, anyway, picking up on this idea of connection and, and blockage um, at the same time, um, you know, what they make enable and make possible and what they prevent and, and constrain and obscure on the other hand. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a fundamental part of what, what I see going on here because and it, it leads back to um, maybe, the, um, maybe the ambivalence of the villagers that I've, that I've been spending time with because they recognize in so many ways, you know, how important these highways are. Um, there was so many people who were so grateful <laughs> to not have to go to Shenzhen or Guangzhou to work, uh, that they could take care of their older parents now um, by coming back to the village at night, um, that they got to know their kids better. Um, this was huge to them. I mean, this was really, really important. Um, and so uh, on balance for many of them, um, you know, the disruption of their lives, the, the fact that, um, farming their fields was no longer a, a, an option and, and the increased vulnerability that they would have because of that, the sense of insecurity <laughs> um, uh, was, was outweighed for many of them by, by, those, um, by those benefits of connection. I guess, and, and so I guess I'll end with just the comment that um, when I say this is all kind of suspension by design, you know, that's also what I'm talking about. The people are eager to kind of jump onto the highway. 
um, and to be part of that circulation system that has been created and recognize that there's, um, that that makes them more vulnerable in certain ways. But for many of them, the alternative has been worse. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. a very, yeah. it's a great, great <laughs> way of, of concluding the session. Um, okay, so let's, we, we'll, we'll have a lunch break now. And if you want to get some suggestions of where to go, <laughs> so we are happy to, to pro provide that. And then the parallel sessions will take place in the, in the main building and, uh, and they are in the older side. So they are in the either in the second, third, and maybe some are also on the fourth floor. But you will have your the the, the student assistants are there also to help and set up the the system for you, and the porter there will be also able to to provide help. Um, and then we'll meet here again at uh, at three o'clock, and and then and then we'll have Tanya Lee, Tanya Lee's keynote. Uh, she will be presenting it online but 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 we are anyway we, we can come here on site to, <laughs> to listen to that and, and Anya will be here commenting commenting her and, and and so on so let's meet here again at three and 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 then you can now go for the different uh, oh, and they are also if, if you are at an, you are now on site and and you want to go to a fully online or an attended fully online session so you can also ask from us but there, we also send that info that there are a couple of rooms there uh, in in the main building where you can where you can listen to to those fully on, on online sessions and also the think corner just opposite it also has that kind of spaces that can be used for that. Okay, but thank you, Timothy. Thank you. <laughs>